So it's Peter Coronius here again with Alastair McGibbon and we're talking about some of the points that Alastair will be touching on in his uh, moment on, on the stage at the 30th anniversary celebrations of the internet in Australia. So firstly Alastair, thank you so much for agreeing to be part of this milestone event. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, in recent times your leadership role in government. Obviously it exposed you to a lot of the inner workings of uh, cyber security uh, as they affect the nation and the threats and the challenges. What are the key takeouts for you that you'll be talking about on the night? So I guess the things I learned for the last four years that I was uh, back in government was the, uh, the, the, the role government has to play in shaping uh, the marketplace and I think the government did that the in April 2016 with the launch of the national cyber security strategy which was well funded pretty ambitious for the time yeah. uh, but events of course uh, you know the way government policy is formed and the way events move around it uh, when we're talking about technology can, can be pretty disruptive right. so um, uh, look, I think the government did a great job of shaping that environment. I think the private sector has done a good job of, of lifting to it. Uh, yeah. When I talk to boards, whether it was in my government capacity or now, um, I think uh, most directors of companies know the right questions to ask, mm -hmm. which they didn't when you and I first started dealing with each other way back, uh, way back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's been a maturation there. I don't know if they know what the right answer is to the questions, right. but, it's a, but it's a step. At least right? they have the questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and some, of course, know the right answer to get. And, and that part of that is caused by the, uh, the legal uh, obligations upon directors. So, you know, cyber security should be on a risk register of any company, right. uh, public or private. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, if it's on a risk register and you're a director, you're responsible. So that partly that shows you the role that the law and consequences can play in driving behaviour. And yes. I think the mandatory or notifiable data breach legislation, again, a classic example of driving behaviours. Yes. And then there's economic incentives, right? Uh, if you get cybersecurity right, and privacy and safety, right? Mm -hmm. For your customers mm -hmm. uh, and your business, you can be more agile and move into parts of, of uh, I guess, commerce that you couldn't do if you don't get it right. Right. So, so there, as I say, there's economic drivers and there's there's political and social drivers and there's the the regulatory and and uh, uh, watching how they've all interacted has been quite fascinating. And I've got to say, you know, as someone that wasn't directly involved in your latest work, <clears throat> but as an external observer and commentator, how gratifying it was for me to see the progress and and really the influence that you brought to really get government to address this as a whole of government approach. And even at the educational level, I remember you instigated some boot camps, did you, for the... For yeah, the yeah, so um, uh, that uh, came about after the, uh, the census uh, review, the mm -hmm. census fail, hashtag census fail, uh, uh, from uh, 2016, August 2016. Uh, and the concept of actually getting public servants and politicians uh, to, to understand cybersecurity. Look, I, I think education is really important. Uh, obviously, awareness and education uh, goes part way. I remember back in the early 2000s when I was in the police talking about education and a, and a guy who I've still, I still deal with, um, who may well be in the audience, so I won't name him, said to me that um, education was the, the crutch for a lazy public servant right. uh, because you're not willing to do a whole range of other things. Mm -hmm. So I think education plays a role and I still quote him by the way uh, regularly as I speak publicly. Education plays a role but it has to be part of a much broader strategy. And if you go back to that uh, census incident, this is April 2016, the then Prime Minister Turnbull launches the strategy. August 2016, the census falls over from you know, some of the world's smallest denial of service attacks. Um, and there's suddenly a public discussion, you know, very visceral, right. lounge room level discussion, yes. um, uh, captured the public imagination, albeit for what was quite a small incident uh, in, in strict technical terms. Mm. Uh, and that was one of a number of things that really were pivot points for that social discourse and the political discourse. Right. So that's where I think events drive things that you can't plan for in government. But hopefully what you learn from those events is that ultimately no one is immune from cyber attack and that whether you're in the private sector or in the government sector, you know, the, the, the warning signs are, are so well established now. But the time has passed where, you know, the mentality that it won't happen to us 
is really a sustainable position to hold. And now it has to be around preparedness and, uh, and uh, you know, breach rehearsal and, and recovery as well. Yeah. So, look, I, you make a great point. Uh, so no one is immune. And, and I've often said, there but for the grace of God goes any other organisation. I've spent my the last half of my life, really, just dealing with cyber failure. Um, that's the only time you ever get to speak, right? You don't go into, <laughs> as I say to journalists when they ask, could you have done better? I say, well, of course, because you wouldn't be talking to me. So that's the first thing. Um, so I think cyber security is a, is a really poor phrase. I mm. think it's cyber risk management, right. um, much less cool as a phrase, but way more accurate. So that's identifying, as you know, um, the risks and, and, and the threats, um, what the consequences will be and what you can manage out. It's accepting the fact that in any uh, environment, risk is going to get realised. Mm -hmm. uh, it just may not be the risks that you think, so that's what you try to get rid of as much as you can. Accept the fact that risk will be realised, detect that risk being realised as quickly as possible, remediate it and get up and going again. Now, um, now, Mike Rothery, who you did a great uh, thing, by the way, on LinkedIn recently, uh, mentioning Mike, and I thought that was really eloquent. Um, Mike used to talk about cyber resilience mm. and the concept of bushfires and flood. Uh, and, you know, you, you try to shape a fire around a town, you let it burn in other places, you try to stop fires from happening by doing back burning and all that other type of stuff. But you accept right. the fact in, you know, one of the world's driest continents that there's going to be uh, uh, fires. Uh, and it's about resilience, so you accept it. Cyber is exactly the same. And actually that fire analogy, it's a great metaphor because it really is the same kind of dynamic that we've got a threat that is incipient, it's, it's ever present as it were. I mean, there are a lot of people now, probably you would agree that we are actually in some form of um, ongoing cyber conflict. It might be below the radar a little bit, but certainly at the nation state level. Certainly there's a, there's, it's a contested space. I think there, you know, nation states see cyber as a means to influence. Clearly, cyber is a great means for espionage, um, and 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 as as a way to influence and shape. Um, uh, and of course, you you add that, and we've done a very poor job, by the way, of driving cost into other nations. Mm. But we also have done a really shocking job of driving cost into criminals to stop them from right. doing their bit. So in an environment where you have a much bigger attack surface, we're relying upon more technology to do more things and more complex things. Um, in an environment where the threat actors haven't been shaped uh, properly, yeah, it's a, it's a particularly dry year, uh, high winds and low humidity. It's a, it's, a, it's a real, if you're using your fire analogy and you're a bushfire commissioner, it's, getting, it's pretty ugly. And then you've got the issue of containment, the issue of protecting the most vulnerable assets, in this yep. case, the town itself. Yep. Uh, you've got the issues of um, bushfire awareness and behavioural change, which is a big mantra of mine. Yep. It's not just awareness, it's got to be behavioural change. Absolutely. And I think we've got to try and bring, uh, one of my pet sort of uh, missions is to try and bring the nexus between risk behaviour and risk consequence into sharper relief. Absolutely. Because I believe there's a lot of behavioural learnings that we learn from other disciplines that can inform, <coughs> excuse me, our uh, attitude to how we change behaviours in relation to cyber. Sure. I agree with you completely, right? The only difference with the bushfire analogy, of course, is um, we know when the catastrophic fire days are. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that it's high wind, very low humidity, you know, etc., etc. Mm. Um, this is kind of like fires that appear from nowhere. Right. Uh, and it could be on a very calm day. So the trouble with, and, and, and look, Mike, uh, you know, and again, I just want to mention Mike, he, he was a foundational uh, uh, shaper of what we're dealing with today. And I reckon he'd be pretty upset. I think he'd be pushing really hard for a whole heap of other change. Uh, That's I'll, interesting because I think of him a lot, you know. Yeah. Um, he made such a big impact yeah. on all of this. And I really think that, I mean, he sat me down one time, we had lunch, I remember, around here in Monica, I think. And he was saying, you know, people are not prepared. This, uh, if there was a, a national emergency, you know, we're trying to tell people to keep two weeks of food in their home. He said, you'd be amazed how many people don't even have that. So he was really thinking a lot about um, preparing for what might seem the inevitable. Yeah. And I just wonder if he was here today, as you say. Would he be satisfied? Yeah. No, he wouldn't have rested, right? No. But it's interesting because we, as we talk about this, so one, I like the natural disaster analogy because Australians can, can, can grasp and understand that. And they know their role in this, so, albeit you constantly see on the news the guy in the singlet and shorts standing on the roof with a garden hose. Right. Um, 
you know, not, not doing all, you know, I live rurally <laughs> doing all the things you're not meant to do, right? A blue, right. blue singlet and yeah. stubbies are not what you're meant yeah, to wear around the fire. a sock right? in the down pipe. Yeah, it, yeah, it was perfect, right? I mean, what could go wrong? Really prepared. <laughs> so we haven't learned well with bushfires. Cybersecurity is, is, is a step worse because we've just done a very poor job, but we need to use those analogies. Mm. Um, uh, but look, what I was going to say is, you know, uh, you, you, you wouldn't build towns you're not allowed to build in some parts now that they've modeled the 100 year flood or or even from a bushfire point of view you've got to use certain types of materials and other right. things we've got a lot of legacy systems online yeah what we haven't done is shaped a regulatory or even frankly a business and economic discussion that says here's how you prepare for that 100 year flood equivalent right. or the bushfire equivalent uh, and that's what businesses and governments need to do. Mm. Uh, and governments can shape that through regulatory environment and law and other things. And businesses should just do it from smart survivability. Continuous. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. how am I going to make money? How am I going to keep the money? How am I going to keep my customers? How am I going to grow? Uh, so we, we started to learn, again, with our town planning, albeit you know, hundreds of years late, um, we need to do the similar thing when it comes to this, this connection technology. It doesn't mean you don't build towns. Right. You just build them and houses in a place where it's, it's best to build them. Technology needs to be the same. And I think this is where we start to have a... This is a long this. ramble through the through the, the, the through brackish minds of two, uh, two uh, <laughs> frankly, uh, bald and uh, past middle-aged guys. But, you know, you know... <laughs> Let's no just, offense. Let's say we've earned every one of these grey hairs. Uh, yeah, both. And of them. we do have a little bit of a crude between us, a bit of wisdom right. Some there. I don't know who's listening to us these days, <laughs> but you know, people listen to you, and I think that um, you know these are the key sort of points. You know, they used to say in advertising, it's only when you start getting sick of the message that the market is just beginning to take notice of it. That's true. And I just wonder whether you know that the message for us is. We have to just keep going on about these issues until, you know, you've got every aspect. Peter Ford, do you remember Peter Ford? I remember Peter Ford. Yeah. So he came, I did some work with them in the OECD in the early 2000s where we wrote the um, uh, international guidelines for e-security, they called yep. it then, uh, best practice. And he came, he was the chair of that working group, which was great to have an Aussie there leading the charge. I mean, the Aussies really, we punched above our weight globally Absolutely, in, yeah. in policy terms. Yep. But Peter came up with the term, culture of cyber security, culture of security. Yeah. That was I, that was the first time I'd seen it mentioned within that sort of context anyway. Um, tell me what you think about this idea of cultural change. You talked about within the business community. How do we extend that idea out to the broader community where we've got you know a lot of people that are, are very almost unthinkingly taking up more and more technology? But where is the, where is the calculus around risk within that framework and mm. how do we penetrate that layer because as you know you know from your government work we business can get everything right government can get everything right but there's that third limb which are the unprotected masses who are now on super fast broadband or not, not quite so much depending on where you are but <laughs> what are we what are we and that's another discussion we might you, not you have. can have that i won't know <laughs> but i mean that. how do we penetrate that level of society. Yeah, look, it's a tough one. I think there's a there's an inherent laziness, um, frankly, from uh, from the business and government community, and I say that respectfully to both sides, um, thinking that this whole digital native thing will solve the problem. Right. All we need is generational change. Yes. You know, my kids, as they become uh, you know consenting adults that are consumers, will use technology in a way that's way wiser right. and knowledgeable than us. Uh, and, and you know, I dispute that. Mm. Uh, they'll, they'll be clearly more immersed in technology, and, and they won't remember the time pre-internet and all that kind of stuff. Like we all do, um, and probably nine tenths of the people in, in the room uh, on the in October thirtieth or October thirty first. Thirty first. There you go. Uh, well, there you go. I was going to turn up on the thirtieth. So <laughs> it's going to be a day early, which makes up for all the times I'm late. I'm just going to say, if I can get there a day early, thirty first of October. for the thirtieth. I'll be there on the thirtieth. I, I, I think it's in my diary for the thirtieth. I'll change it straight after this. What I was going to say though is, I think we, I think we, we, it's, it's hope, and and I'm told by people who are not the most uh, uh, best planner I've ever met 
uh, that hope is not a strategy. The hope is that young kids who grow up with these technologies. Now, the trouble is you, in order to be a, an early adopter of technology and in the policy space like you were, well before others could see the need for it, mm. had to understand technology, uh, look at its application, look at the pluses and the minuses and work out how to shape it. Right. Um, if you grow up with it just ubiquitously with much better user interfaces, you don't have to understand it as much. Mm -hmm. And I think we're creating a population of, of, of really dumb users. I count myself amongst them, so I'm not trying to be offensive. Um, the danger with that is we assume because people use technology, they understand the consequences of. Yeah. And, and, and I think you've only got to look at things like um, how much information we have given away, all of us, because we're, we're, all, we're all in this glass house, to social media companies, to big tech companies. I know some of them are in the room, and I'm, and I'm not trying to be offensive to them. Uh, but we really have failed to understand the concept of privacy, safety, and security. We haven't built in. Julian and Grant, uh, the safety commissioner, uh, uh, the best e-safety commissioner we've had in the country, because there's only a, one other choice. Oh, and, that's very and no, she is, you. No, she is. But one, one of the things I like about what Julie's doing is this concept of safety by design, mm -hmm. uh, which goes to your culture question. Mm -hmm. So it's it's engineering and coding safety, and at the same time as creating culture, because. Education, as I said, is one thing, engineering is another, but they've, they've got to be unified in their purpose. Um, and I like the concept of safety, privacy, and security by design, where the devices are fit for purpose. Um, I often wonder as I stroll, this is a weird stroll through the, the arcane mind of McGibbon and clearly Coronius, but um, what I was going to say is I wonder sometimes if the application of our offline consumer protection laws and product safety and standards should just be applied online. Mm. Now, I, I remember arguing in this case years ago when I was in the police. Um, you know, a computer should just be fit for purpose. I right? remember you arguing. Yeah, this. I, and, but and you I didn't remember, get a lot of uh, no. And, and, and most people don't like what I say, no, particularly no. tech companies. No. But it's the concept of things being fit for purpose. If I had a microwave that exploded, or a, or a better, better example would be a, a, a front loader washing machine that catches fire, the, the consumer safety law would say that that's not a fit for purpose right, product. Right. Why is it? Now these are complex bits of code and complex bits of tech, don't get me wrong, I'm very sympathetic and I'm grateful for them. Mm -hmm. If they're not fit for purpose, um, then they shouldn't be on the market. And I'm going to say the reason why they keep not being fit for purpose is we want them to be a microwave and a washing machine and a fridge and a can opener and a computer at the same time. Mm -hmm. But a device that's fit for purpose that does my email or my word processing might just want to do that yeah and then maybe we could get to that concept of, of product safety and consumer law and i think that'll save us weirdly see that's funny julie had introduced me to howard schmidt who you know yep yeah great guy and howard had then got the big job in the white house of, of advising yeah. obama and it actually very generously picked up our iCode and uh yeah and well you influenced for hundreds of millions of people through your iCode 267 million americans actually yep. it was the amount we worked out from um the FCC announcement on those US yep. telcos. But the point I was going to make about um, Howard was that before that, when Julie introduced me to him, yep. he was still the CSO at Microsoft. Yep. And he used to tell me privately, and this is not you know, a shot at Microsoft, but he would say how frustrated he was that there was all that legacy code and the buffer overruns and the inherent um, vulnerabilities within the, the system itself that uh, uh, he was tearing his hair out to see how he could re-engineer essentially the, the company's approach to baking in, I mean, they had effectively unwittingly well, they, baked in insecurity. They started secure coding, right? right. They, that, that's what drove it. And interestingly, I think Microsoft is a classic example of a company that learnt through that process. And I think it was because of a lot of his work, oh, of work in there. Again, another another person we should We will remember how it, I mean, yeah. He was, he was a global leader. Yes, um, he was. And, 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 a, and, a, and a real, a, and a really decent guy. Mm. And weirdly, it was because everyone, I mean, the reason why Microsoft was targeted, it wasn't just, frankly, at that time, shoddy code. Um, it was fit for purpose code, right? Compared to all other code. Right. It was the fact that, they were devices that were in poor people's lounge rooms well, and businesses. And, the other and thing criminals was, aren't stupid. They go for they go for where the hey, why do you rob a bank? Uh, you that's know, where, where, the money where the money is. And w w what computer you break into? You break into the one where there's more numbers of them. And do you remember the other thing? I remember telling audiences a long time ago when cyber was just becoming um, an issue. I said the thing that we didn't know then, really right back in the early days, yeah. before the criminals got involved, 
the internet was never designed to be no, secure. Of course not. Because everyone trusted everybody else. Yeah. Well, I went to eBay, if you recall. I, I started I eBay 2004. Um, eBay uh, w was built at a time when the you know there was unicorns and and puppy dogs on the internet. It was beautiful. Yeah. And and uh, the thing that saved it was the concept of feedback. Right. Uh, because it was the best predictor of people's behaviour. Yes. But. At the time it was set up, and and while it, it was beautiful, if people knew each other, the internet was a great place. Criminals worked out pretty quickly that because it's beautiful and a great place, it's a, also a good place for them to do business. Mm. Um, and and but eBay saved itself through just like Microsoft learning that process. Uh, how do you defend yourself in this increasingly toxic environment? Mm. Still make fit for purpose things. Um, so, you know, again, that's a, that's a good. That's, you know, they're all good news stories. Mm. You know, humans have have, you know gone to the moon, hopefully we'll go to Mars, all those other things, create amazing technologies, uh, use them, work out where it goes wrong, and, and we, we, um, uh, we adapt. Thank you so much, Cheers, Alistair. Man. Good to it's see you. It's been so great to see you again and hang out, and um, we'll have more discussions like this. I think we should do a whole series of these videos and <laughs> the collective wisdom. No one will watch in them, In this fine setting. We'll, we'll at least Canberra. feel good sitting outside here in Canberra. So thank you again, Alistair. We Cheers. look forward to seeing you on the 31st of October. 31st down at Dalton House in Sydney and uh, the URL for the people that are interested in registering and coming along is 30igala.com.au. Thank you and we'll see you then.